The top stories tonight and why news. A COVID-19 vaccine may be available by next year according to President Rodrigo Duterte. Malacanang says this statement of the president is not a political placebo but is based on science. It is based on science. The fact na ang dami na pong nasa third clinical trial means na nandyan na po talaga ang uh, remedyo. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Mall operators are considering to extend their operating hours as well as conduct mall-wide sale. Also, the president's cabinet members agreed to recommend shortening the curfew to only four hours. After President Duterte called out the alleged corruption in the Department of Public Works and Highways, a senator believes that the bill giving emergency powers to the president will address corruption in all agencies under the executive department. The Labor Department assures no employer is allowed to defer their employees 13 month pay. We will not postpone, we will not defer, and we will not give an exemption to the payment of the 13 month pay. Coronavirus hit Vega Dream Ship leaves Australian waters for the Philippines, while Western Australia's health minister says that Aussie mining companies have agreed to no longer use Manila-based ship crew members. Singapore's round-trip cruises are taking sail in a new pilot program. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Thursday, October 15, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the country and in other parts of the world. I'm Angelo Castro III. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William Theo. Malacanang says that President Rodrigo Duterte's statement on COVID-19 vaccine is not a political placebo, but is based on science. Our palace correspondent, Rosalie Cons, will tell us why live. Yes, Rosalie. Harleen, every time President Rodrigo Duterte addresses the nation on COVID-19 response, he mentions the issue of COVID-19 vaccine. Last night, he said, as mentioned to him by Health Secretary Francisco Duque III, the much-anticipated COVID-19 vaccine might be available in April next year. The palace was asked if this is just a political placebo of the president, but was denied by Malacanã. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque said the statements of the president were to address the pandemic fatigue of the public. The fact na ang dami na pong nasa third clinical trial means na nandyan na po talaga ang uh, remedyo. There is light at the end of the towel. Meanwhile, President Duterte revealed yesterday that Russia plans to establish a pharmaceutical company in the country on COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing. The chief executive has been saying that the Philippines will either buy vaccine from Russia or China. I just had a talk with the ambassador of Russia, the outgoing, uh, and we had a serious one-on-one uh, -on -one talk. And they said that Russia is coming in. Meron na siguro And they want to establish here gagawa sila ng planta pharmaceutical pharmaceutical naman and uh, ang vaccine papasok the government has already found a funding source for the 40 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine to be freely distributed to 20 million poorest Filipinos. Though President Duterte also mentioned he wanted to give the vaccine to everyone but he needs to find a source of money for it. Harleen? So, so, Rosalie, where will the president get the funds for the COVID-19 vaccine? 
Well, Harleen Malacanang has mentioned that Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines will extend loans to the Philippine International Trading Corporation, which will purchase the COVID-19 vaccines chosen by the government once they are available. But if the vaccine will be available in 2021, then it will be funded by the 2021 national budget. Harleen? Thank you so much, Rosalie Cause reporting live. The government is seeking a faster COVID-19 test as the Philippine economy reopens. And saliva-based COVID-19 test is something the National Task Force Against COVID-19 is waiting to be available in the market. Ray Pelayo tells us why. Several countries are already using saliva-based testing for coronavirus infection due to its fast turnaround time for a result just like what rapid and antigen tests can do. So yung saliva test ay pwede ako nagkakamali ay aabutin lang ng 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes no, para antigen test. RT-PCR test is the gold standard as recommended by the World Health Organization but it takes a longer time for a result to come out. So pag pumasa ho ito, mainam na po yan kasi ang airports natin, bibilis ho ang galaw ng tao at sigurado na yung sasakay ng aeroplano at yung tatanggap na LGU o bansa sa mga nagbibiyahe ay siguradong ligtas sa COVID. National Task Force Against COVID-19 clarifies that the pilot test for the antigen test kit in Baguio City is, is still under validation. This statement was issued after NTF spokesperson Restituto Padilla mentioned in an interview that the pilot test was a failure. So naghahanap pa po tayo ng isang testing protocol. Ang lumabas po dun sa Baguio ay out of, kasi sabay po yung ginawa ang PCR test at saka ang antigen test. At ang lumabas po yung resulta kung di ako nagkakamali, mahigit kalahati lang po ang tugma ng antigen test na lumabas na resulta ng PCR test. So, hindi gusto po ng DOH na at least 85% pana ang tugma. The official notes that faster COVID-19 testing is necessary for a wider opening of the economy. According to the Food and Drug Administration, there are several FDA-approved antigen kits, including two that are authorized by the WHO. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The Food and Drug Administration confirms that the Vaccine Expert Panel has approved China's potential COVID-19 vaccine, but its Phase 3 clinical trial may not yet begin. Here's why from Aiko Miguel. The clinical trial Phase 3 of China's Sinovac may start in November according to the country's Food and Drug Administration. But FDA Director General and Health Undersecretary Eric Domingo says this trial phase must be approved by the Ethics Board Committee before the potential vaccine gets evaluated. Once Sinovac gets the Ethics Board approval, the manufacturer of the potential COVID-19 vaccine can apply for a clearance. Of course, hindi pwedeng maka-start ng any study until hindi complete ang ethics approval. And officially, wala pang application sa FDA. Nasabihan lang kami ng PEP na may pumasa na sa kanila. According to Undersecretary Domingo, they are expecting Sinovac's manufacturer to submit an application for a clinical trial by next week. FDA's final decision on the regulatory application of a vaccine manufacturer can be released after eight days. The clinical trial phase three of a potential vaccine can last for three to six months, according to the FDA. The health department is also preparing for a vaccine supply chain to avoid spoilage of any approved COVID-19 vaccine. According to experts, vaccines are perishable and must be stored with appropriate temperature. This supply chain is intended to sustain the quality and efficacy of a vaccine from the time of manufacture until administration to people. Kasama po sa paghahanda natin yung ating logistics management which includes warehousing and the distribution of these vaccines. And we are very much aware of these specific uh, temperatures that has to uh, go along no, with the storage of specific vaccines. I go Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Mall operators are considering to extend their operating hours as well as conduct a mall wide sale. Also, the President's cabinet members agreed to recommend shortening the curfew to only four hours. Asher Kadapan Jr. 
explains why. The Department of Trade and Industry has recently released a memorandum circular allowing the non-leisure operations of malls and commercial establishments until 11 p.m. DTI Secretary Ramon Lopez says that mall-wide sales may resume but he still needs to clarify the matter with the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases. Malls have been operating only from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. on weekdays and until 9 p.m. on weekends. But to help revive the economy while preventing malls from getting overcrowded, mall operators are now considering to extend their operating hours. They are also looking to conduct mall-wide sales so consumers may take advantage of low prices of goods. But one mall operator we spoke with said these undertakings depend on several other factors that must also be considered. It really depends on what the government or ano yung direction sa atin ng IETS, di ba? So let's say if there is a shortening of the curfew and then uh, there's more transportation that will be dadagdagan ng transportation, yung mga transportation routes, then we, we, have, we can consider. Malacanang, however, said that the cabinet members have agreed to shorten the curfew hours as the economy gradually opens. The usual 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew will be shortened to 4 hours or from 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. So, ang decision po ng uh, gabinete, i-recommend na nga sa lahat ng mga uh, local government units na paikliin na yung curfew. Ma ito po yung rekomendasyon sa mga local government units na sila naman po magpapatupad ito sa pamamagitan ng mga ordinansa. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, on the other hand, said they have yet to discuss the matter on their end. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Meanwhile, the country's Department of Health says that 2,261 new cases were reported today, raising the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the Philippines to 348,698. That's 462 less than Indonesia's total confirmed cases as of today, more than 349,000. The National Capital Region logged over 500 new cases today. The highest among provinces and regions. The total active cases further increased to 48,040, of which 84.6% are in mild condition, while 10.7% are asymptomatic. We have lost 50 more patients, but through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 385 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to 294,161. Thanks be to God. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic reached a total of more than 38.5 million confirmed cases in 189 countries, regions, and sovereignties. That's after more than 200,000 new cases were reported across many countries in the last 24 hours. The fast-spreading disease has claimed over 1.09 million lives after almost 4,000 death cases reported from yesterday, while almost 26.7 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection thanks be to god president rodrigo duterte revealed there is corruption within the department of public works and highways but he says he fully trusts the department secretary rosalie Cos explains why Despite the allegations of corruption in the Department of Public Works and Highways, President Rodrigo Duterte still trusts Public Works and Highways Secretary Mark Villar. This is the response of Malacanang when asked about the President's statement last night when he addressed the Filipino nation. I have full trust and confidence po kay Secretary Villar dahil uh, despite the corruption in uh, DPWH na nakadeliver po si uh, Secretary Villar, it helps na mas marami pang pera ang pamilya ni uh, Secretary Villar kaysa sa DPWH. No? It was President Duterte himself who said there is massive corruption in the DPWH and that there was no infrastructure project that could be started without under-the-table facilitation fees. Ito lang. Toma contractor, the first week, makamoy ka lang 
na hinihingi ang ka dito sa DPWH malakas yan dyan projects yung mga project engineers yan dyan lahat uh, road right of way grabe ang corruption dyan walang walang construction na o umpisa dito na walang transaksyon. Meron yan. Malacanang says it is possible to create a task force to investigate alleged corruption in the department. But for now, the government's priority is to resolve the issue of irregularities in the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. Rosa Licos, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. After President Duterte called out the alleged rampant corruption in the Department of Public Works and Highways or DPWH, Senate Majority Leader Miguel Zubiri said he believes the bill that seeks to give emergency powers to the president will address corruption in all agencies under the executive department. Yesterday, the Senate unanimously passed Senate Bill Number 1844 right after it was certified as urgent by President Duterte. The bill seeks to authorize the president to expedite the processing and issuance of permits, licenses, and certifications in times of national emergency. According to Zubiri, once the bill is signed into law, the president will have the power to further shorten the processing time in government transactions prescribed under the Republic Act 11032 or the Ease of Doing Business Law. He adds this would eliminate extortion or payment of bribes. The measure also reiterates the constitutional power of the president to suspend or remove any government official or employee who are involved in bureaucratic red tape. The senator who also sponsored the bill said the emergency powers of the president will also make the processing of claims in Phil Health faster. Zubiri explains the law will no longer require an implementing rules and regulations and it will be up to the president how many days he would like to shorten the transactions in various government agencies. Those applications for permits, licenses, and certifications that will not be acted upon by the government agency within the prescribed period of the president will be deemed approved according to Zubiri. The applicant can also go to the Anti-Red Tape Authority or ARTA to get a certification to proceed and as a proof that the application was not acted upon. Isa sa mga napapatagal ng uh, applications sa uh, mga kapatid ay uh, napakaraming requirements. Di ba? Bibigyan ka ng, ng five pages long ng mga requirements. Under this uh, measure of the President, he can actually remove these requirements altogether and let or the releasing authority make the decision to release the certificates, licenses, and permits without need of these other requirements. Makakabilis po ito sa mga transaction uh, ng private sector uh, dito sa ating mga government agencies. The bill also includes the Food and Drug Administration or FDA for a faster release of medicines and other equipment needed against COVID-19. A similar measure has been filed in the House of Representatives. Later, Representative Martin Romualdez, who is one of the authors of the bill, said they will pass the measure before Friday or the last day of special session. Tagig Pateros Representative Alan Peter Cayetano reminds House Speaker Lord Alan Velasco to keep his word that no major changes will happen in leadership positions within the House of Representatives. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. Another reshuffling of key posts in the House of Representatives happened under the leadership of House Leader Lord Alan Velasco. Camarini Sur 2nd District Representative Ellery Villafuerte a known ally of Tagig Pateros Representative Alan Peter Caetano, was removed as Deputy Speaker. One Pacman Party List Representative Mikey Romero, a staunch ally of Velasco, was elected to replace Villafuerte in the post. Quezon Representative Angeli Natan was reinstated as the chairperson of the Committee on Health, replacing Gimaras Representative Lucille Nava, while Davao City First District Representative Paulo Duterte replaced Representative Abraham Tolentino of the 6th District as the Chairman of the Committee on Accounts. 
Oriental Mindoro Representative Doy Lechon was elected as Senior Deputy Speaker as a replacement to Congressman Paolo Duterte. With this reshuffling, Cayetano reminded Velasco of their agreement on the leadership of the lower house of Congress. Sabi mo sa akin, palabra de honor, de palabra de honor din sa side nyo. Dahil malinaw na malinaw na sinabi ng ating Pangulo that he doesn't want disruption so walang palitan ng kahit sinong chairmanship at leadership sa Kongreso. Cayetano also revealed that some of Velasco's allies are talking to some of his to have them leave their posts. There are now some of your people na gustong benga talking to some of our people na magpalit na lang, umalis na lang, uh, pati kwarto kinukuha. Cayetano said that Velasco must instead focus on the passage of the 2021 proposed national budget as his allies are also ready to assist the new House Speaker. Also, Velasco met with members of the minority, the National Unity Party, Nationalista Party, and the Makabayan Bloc. In an interview, Minority Floor Leader Benny Abante said Cayetano is welcome to join the minority if he wishes to do so. Abante adds that he is willing to give Cayetano the minority leader post if Cayetano wishes to have it. Sa akin, if he is willing to uh, get the minority minority leader position, I would I would be very glad to give that to him. If he wants to be the minority leader, we'll, we'll talk about it. Pero alam mo, palagay ko, I don't think he will he, he will get that. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Senate will resume session earlier than scheduled. According to Senate President Vicente Soto III, they will resume session on November 9. That's a week earlier than the original schedule on the legislative calendar, which is on November 16. This is to tackle the proposed 2021 national budget and the corporate recovery and tax incentives for enterprises or create bill. Soto said he has instructed the Senate Secretary to inform the House of Representatives and clarify that the lower chamber is not compelled to do the same. The session in Senate has been suspended tonight while the House of Representatives is set to adjourn its special session tomorrow. Following his Bayaran remark towards scientists from the University of the Philippines, Environment Undersecretary Benny Antiporda apologizes to UP experts. Joanna Nano tells us why. Environment Yusek Benny Antiporta explains that his Bayaran remark came out because of his emotion. He emphasizes that the DNR should be consulted about UP's findings instead of criticizing the Dolomite Sand in Malida Bay. Yusek Antiporta clarifies that he is apologizing only to the UP experts who have nothing to do with the issue. And his apology does not include those who are criticizing the artificial white sand in Manila Bay. Sa MSI, meron pong ilan lang po na mga batikos dito na hindi man lang kami binigyan ng pasintabi. Yung po, hindi po umihingi ng tawad doon. Pero doon po sa mga walang kinalaman dito, kahit na nasa loob po ng MSI, umihingi po o lang paumanhin. The UP Marine Science Institute or MSI accepted Antiporda's apology, saying there is no bad blood between them and the DNR. Meanwhile, the UP Geographic Society has issued an open letter calling for Antiporda's resignation. The environment official responded that he is willing to resign if these people can replace him from his job. If they can do my job for the uh, department and the people of the Philippines, why not? So be it. Pwede naman po. Personal po. Ay naglilinis tayo sa dagat na yan. Personal, naglilinis po tayo mula Laguna Lake hanggang dito po sa Pasig River. Uh, kung kaya po nila gawin yan, eh, wala ang problema. Uh, handa po tayo mag-resign. The UPMSI has made a statement earlier. It is charging its client for a specific scientific research covering the use of its laboratories and facilities. Funds collected are used for facility maintenance. The group also clarifies that the DNR did not pay more than half a billion pesos. Instead, they receive only more than 346 million pesos as payment for 10 collaborative projects for over a decade. Joan Naru, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Labor Secretary Silvestre Bello III assures workers there is no reason to worry about whether or not they will receive their 13-month pay come December. Mirasol Abogadil will tell us why. The Department of Labor and Employment settled once and for all the deadlock about employees' 13th-month pay. 
we will not postpone, we will not defer, and we will not give an exemption to the payment of the 13-month pay. Earlier today, Labor Secretary Silvestre Bellio III said that the law states that workers should receive their 13-month pay on or before December 24th every year, and this is what the government will implement. The officials said that they are finalizing the proposal for the Department of Finance regarding the subsidy for micro and small enterprises who cannot afford to give their workers 13-month pay. Aside from the subsidy, they are looking into another option to help distressed employers. Nag-request kami kay Secretary Dominguez na kung mari, bigyan ng subsidy yung mga employers that are categorized as micro and small business enterprises. Kung mabigyan sila ng subsidy o kaya pagbigyan sila ng opportunity to make loans with our banks. The Labor Department did not specify the budget they will allot for the program and the number of employers or companies that will benefit from the subsidy. Meanwhile, labor groups lauded Dole's announcement. According to Associated Labor Union Trade Union of the Philippines or ALU-TUCP, this is a good news to millions of employees who were demoralized this past weeks upon knowing that their 13th month pay might be deferred or altogether scrapped. For its part, the Finance Department is just waiting for Dole's proposal so that they could determine if they have the budget to cover the program. Mirasol Abugadil, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Now, here's a glimpse of what's the weather like in parts of the country. Tropical depression Ophel continues to move westward over the West Philippine Sea. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says as of 3 p.m. today, Ophel was located at 340 kilometers west-northwest of Tanawan City, Batangas. It has maximum sustained winds of 45 kilometers per hour near the center and gustiness of up to 55 kilometers per hour. According to Pagasa, there was an increasing light likelihood likelihood that Ophel will weaken into a low pressure area within the next 12 to 24 hours over the West Philippine Sea. This will bring light to moderate with at times heavy rains over mainland Cagayan Valley, Cordillera Administrative Region, and Central Luzon. Meanwhile, northern Samar, eastern Samar, Samar, Palawan, including Calamian and Calayaan Islands, will also experience light to moderate with at times heavy rains due to the southwest monsoon or hanging habagat. Ophel may also bring occasional gusts over Zambales, Bataan, Cavite, Batangas, Occidental, Mindoro, and Palawan including Calamian and Calayaan Islands. Gusty conditions may also be felt over Bataan, Babuyan Group of Islands, Cordillera Administrative Region, Aurora, and the coastal and mountainous areas of Ilocos Norte and mainland Cagayan, Valley due to northeasterly surface wind flow. The Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency vows to obey the president's directive to destroy all confiscated illegal drugs. Another huge destruction of illegal drugs is scheduled next month. Leah Ilagan reports why. The Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency is proud to say that the usual one to two month process of destroying illegal drugs now takes only a week just like the directive of President Rodrigo Duterte. PIDEA Director General Wilkins Villanueva explains, the court immediately releases a court order for the destruction of confiscated illegal drugs. Kami po ay lubos na nagpapasalamat sa suporta ng ating Department of Justice at sa suporta ng Office of Court Administration dahil sila na po ang talagang gumagalaw para matulungan ang PIDEA na masira itong mga illegal na droga na nasa aming pa, uh, pamamahala. Villanueva also confirms they have destroyed 1,394 kilograms of illegal drugs and paraphernalia worth 6.25 billion pesos in Trece Martires, Cavite. 
They have only 1,529 kilograms left to be destroyed on November 26. Pag natapos po ito, zero-zero po ang inventory ng PIDEA. So next month, asahan nyo na mauubos ang ebidensya namin dyan sa storage, uh, sa PIDEA storage ng uh, laboratory service. The PIDEA Director General also adds that destroying confiscated drugs will remove the doubt of the public that operatives recycle drugs. Ang destruction po ngayong linggo ay sasabayan din po ng destruction ng illegal na droga sa buong Pilipinas. Nakatalagang mag-destroy ang buong PIDEA ng, halag ng uh, more or less 219 kilograms of assorted dangerous drugs na nagkakahalaga ng 132 million pesos. This is PIDEA's third huge destruction of illegal substances since 2017. They have destroyed more than 70% of illegal drugs since President Rodrigo Duterte assumed office. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Department of Justice assures the constitutionality of the anti-terrorism law implementing rules and regulations. But various groups are ready to challenge the IRR. Dante Amento tells us why. The implementing rules and regulations of the controversial Anti-Terrorism Act are expected to be published this week. Some 37 petitions have been filed at the Supreme Court by different groups such as Gabriela and the Integrated Bar of the Philippines challenging the constitutionality of the law. These include provisions of arresting and detaining of suspected terrorist individuals without a judicial warrant of arrest, designation of terrorist groups or organizations, and a broad definition of terrorism. But the Department of Justice says the IRR, which they had drafted, contains the detailed provisions on terrorism and terrorism-related crimes and designation of terrorist individuals and groups, among others. It also clarifies what a citizen must or must not to do to comply with the law. The DOJ stresses drafting the IRR was a very delicate job and they consulted the Constitution, other existing implementing rules and regulations, and even the rules of court. Meanwhile, human rights lawyer and one of the petitioners, attorney Edri Ulalia, asks the Supreme Court to act immediately on their petitions. He also appeals to the public to be vigilant for possible violations of human rights as consequences of the law. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Meanwhile, a shopping aggregator group hypo hypothesizes that the Philippines is now catching up with its Southeast Asian peers in terms of digital adaptations. Jerry Lu Duriga explains why. The Philippine e-commerce industry has experienced skyrocketing improvement despite the closure of a lot of businesses amid the pandemic. According to Isabel Romualdez, content marketing executive of Our Prize Group, people spending more time online has done something good for the digital economy. Now the Philippines is catching up to its Southeast Asian peers in terms of the digital economy because we were behind before like cash was our main mode of transactions but now like we're learning to adapt digitally. After comparing the second quarter of 2020 with the first quarter, data shows that the Philippines experienced the highest increase of 53% in the usage of shopping apps in Southeast Asia. And the total sessions in shopping apps in the country reached 4.9 billion based on the studies conducted by shopping aggregator group iPrice. Demographic records show that the age group 35 to 44 has the highest spending frequency rate followed by the age bracket 25 to 34, while a significant increase was also seen in people between the ages 45 to 54. Room Waters revealed that Filipino online shoppers didn't just purchase essential goods, but also things that can be used for their outdoor activities. During the start of the lockdowns around May, uh, a lot of people searching for essentials like sanitizing things, hand sanitizers or Lysol and thermometers. But uh, an interesting thing that we found is that Filipinos were also looking for outdoor swimming pools, Wi-Fi adapters or like bicycles.
According to iPrice, all data on the total visits on desktop and mobile web in the study were taken from global traffic figures from the respective websites as of June 2020 from Similar Web, a platform for measuring online behavior. Jordi Duriga, UN TV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And for the news abroad, here's Maria Latosa reporting live from Perth, Australia. William Bank Westpac will be closing its Mumbai, Jakarta, Hong Kong, Beijing and Shanghai branches after a comprehensive review of its global operations was done. This means around 200 mostly local employees would lose their jobs. Matthew Wilson, a banking analyst from the Evans and Partners, stated the move to close the bank's branches in Asia was consistent with the group's wider strategy to cut back expenditure and for simplifying operations. Additionally, a Westpac spokesman said that this was a completely commercial decision to allow consolidation for offshore businesses in London, New York and Singapore. Westpac has denied that the closure of the three Chinese branches is linked to the souring relations between Canberra and Beijing and emphasized that the move is only a part of its international operations. Meanwhile, let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases in countries worst hit by the pandemic. The United States of America now has more than 7.9 million confirmed cases and still has the highest among the 189 countries, regions and sovereignty hit by the pandemic. It also has the highest death toll of over 216,000. Meanwhile, officials in the U.S. and Germany say the latest upsurge in infections is due to people not observing basic rules. Also in London, officials will impose tougher restrictions from Saturday, including a ban on households mixing. And in France, people are awaiting details of how officials plan to enforce a new curfew and state of emergency. The growing community transmission in New South Wales has posed concerns on how the state's health department has stressed its concerns about the declining number of people getting tested. One of our New South Wales correspondents, Early Briones, will join us tonight for The Reason Why Live. Yes, Early. Marielle. New South Wales Health Minister Brad Hazard expressed his concerns about the decline in number of people getting tested for COVID-19. He also emphasized the importance to the public of being truthful in providing detailed information of their movement when asked by the health officials for contact tracing purposes. This is what Health Minister Hazard said. Whether it's deliberate, whether it's uh, just simply overlooked, you need to make sure that it's neither of those things. You need to make sure that you tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth and be very, very careful in what you're telling public health officials. The public health officials need to be able to, to track the chains of transmission. That's impossible if people don't actually give us the fulsome information on where they've been. New South Wales recorded 4,132 total COVID-19 cases and 11 new infections overnight, while there were 15,802 tests conducted in the last 24 hours. That number is slightly lower than the daily testing target of no less than 16,000. Minister Hazard further said that the New South Wales government is very keen in lessening the restrictions and will continue to monitor the daily cases and provide health advice in due time so that more restrictions could be eased. While there's a strong message about coming forward for testing, the New South Wales government has not made wearing a face mask mandatory and remains optional. But New South Wales Health is strongly recommended for the public to always carry a clean face mask when a distance of 1.5 meters cannot be observed, or when visiting high-risk places including public transports, supermarkets, shops, places of worship, and entertainment venues. New South Wales is due to open its international border tomorrow, October 16, with neighboring country New Zealand to its one-way travel bubble agreement. The bubble allows 
for New Zealand residents to travel to New South Wales without having to spend a day on quarantine. Marielle? Early regarding those COVID-19 infected individuals, what are the penalties if they are proven guilty of intentionally or mistakenly not disclosing important information for contact tracing? Marielle, the New South Wales Health Minister warned all individuals that will be contacted by the New South Wales Health contact tracers that they need to disclose all information relevant or related to the contact tracing process because all information are vital to trace the, tran the transmission chains. New South Wales Health Minister Hazard also mentioned that warnings had been released to a number of aged care facilities somewhere around the borders of New South Wales and Victoria. With all the warnings given out, no specific penalty or punishment was disclosed to the public. Marielle? All right, thank you, Early Brianna's reporting live from New South Wales. The Thai cabinet approved last October 12 a project to offer tax incentives. Charise Longbowen, who is now in Bangkok, Thailand, will tell us why live. Yes, Charise. Marielle, Thailand Prime Minister Prayut chan announced that the cabinet approved the granting of personal income tax deductions of up to 30,000 baht or around 47,000 pesos to individual taxpayers on their purchase of goods and services with 7% value-added tax, effective from 23rd of October to the 31st of December this year. The goal is to boost domestic consumption and reviving of the pandemic-hit economy. However, alcoholic drinks, tobacco, oil and gas for vehicles, automobiles, motorcycles, boats, newspapers, and magazines are not covered by this deduction. According to Deputy Prime Minister and Energy Minister Supatana Pongpun Michai, the project is aimed at injecting 200 billion baht to the economy for the rest of the year. As for newly appointed Finance Minister Arkom Term Pitaya Paisit, his focus is on stimulating consumption and revitalization of the tourism industry and supply chain. Marielle? Therese, are there other financial assistance the government will be providing to its people in Thailand? Marielle, the cabinet also approved a co-payment of 3,000 baht to 10 million Thai citizens for their purchase of food and general products, not including lottery tickets, alcoholic drinks, and tobacco. Also, an additional 1,500 baht will be given to 14 million citizens with state welfare cards for their monthly living allowance, to be given in equal installments monthly for October to December. Well, Thank you, Therese Longbowen, reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. The Biden campaign announced a huge increase in campaign donations a few weeks before the elections. One of our USA correspondents, Sonny Cause, will give the details why. Former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden's campaign announced that he has amassed a total of $383 million last September, breaking his previous record last August. The huge upsurge of campaign fund donations was a result of the first several developments in the Biden campaign. The first uptick was when he announced Senator Kamala Harris as his vice presidential candidate last August, followed by the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and after the recent presidential debate wherein Trump announced that he was tested positive with COVID-19. U.S. President Donald Trump and the Republican National Committee has yet to declare their recent fundraising numbers, but the current financial declaration is a big difference from last spring, where Trump was way ahead with the campaign funds compared to Biden's. The massive campaign war chest of the former VP comes in the final stretch of the campaign to November 3 election, and after the new polls indicate that Biden is still leading in several must-win states for Trump. Sunny Cost, UN TV News and Rescue, USA. We serve the people. We give glory to God. 
coronavirus-plagued ship Vega Dream leaves Australian waters for the Philippines, while Western Australia's health minister says Aussie mining companies have agreed to no longer use Manila-based ship crew members. Joining us tonight is one of our fellow correspondents here in Perth, Australia, Marvi Delphine, to give the details why live. Yes, Marvi. Marielle, 19, 19 Filipino crew members are currently on board the coronavirus-plagued BHP charter ship anchored off Western Australia's Pilbara coast, which has finally set sail for return to the Philippines. The Australian Maritime Safety Authority, or AMSA, cleared the fully laden iron ore bulk carrier Verga Dream for departure last night. On October 10, there were 20 Filipinos initially on its arrival from Manila via Shanghai, but one crew member had to be transferred from the vessel and taken to the Headland Health Campus for clinical care overnight after falling ill to the virus. After laboratory confirmation of his COVID-19 positive result, he is now in hotel quarantine at Perth while he recovers. Six out of the remaining 19 seafarers are also infected with COVID-19, but will stay and self-isolate in their own quarters on the Vega Dream as the health minister says they are in good spirits. According to an official statement, the Western Australian Department of Health offered assistance to the COVID-19 positive crew in line with its commitment to humanitarian care. However, as medical intervention is not currently required, this was declined. Health Minister Roger Cook is urging the federal government to ensure Filipino authorities strengthen their maritime crew arrangements. Mr. Cook said, these poor crew are having to join these vessels under very arduous circumstances and conditions anyway. He added, the fact that they are put on the vessel in a manner that potentially gives them the coronavirus is really of great concern and the Commonwealth should be reaching out to the Filipino government to say, get your house in order. The Vega Dream was the second vessel to arrive from Manila with virus-affected crew members within a fortnight, following the outbreak on the now-departed Patricia Audendorf bulk carrier. Meanwhile, Health Minister Cook has confirmed that Aussie mining companies have agreed to no longer use Manila-based ship crew members until the Philippines effectively responds to this maritime concern. Muriel? Marvi, if the Philippines does follow the advice of Western Australia regarding COVID-19 infection prevention and control, will the maritime operations between the two return to normal? Muriel, we are yet to see how the Department of Transportation in the Philippines protocol for crew change and repatriation will comply. About 30% of the crews which sail to Pilbara here in Western Australia are based in Manila. Chamber of Minerals and Energy WA Chief Executive Paul Everingham said that its members had been talking to shipping agents about sourcing crews from other countries instead of the Philippines. But this will take time as new arrangements are being made. Marielle? All right, Marvi, we can only hope for our fellow Filipinos' good health and safe voyage back to the Philippines. Thank you for that live report. Another news on cruise ships, Singapore plans to allow cruise lines to provide round-trip cruises without ports of call in an effort to regain tourism revenue. From Singapore, Roy Cheka will tell us why live. Yes, Roy. Marielle, Singapore is having another go at reviving its tourism industry with cruises to nowhere entering the list. The Royal Caribbean International and Genting Cruise Lines will take part in a pilot program that allows cruise ships to make round-trip sales without ports of call. The Singapore Tourism Board announced last Thursday, October 8. The cruise lines are planning to have a series of cruises that sail up to four nights out at sea. Bookings are quickly being made with tickets already being sold out as the cruises start sailing on November onwards, just in time for the year-end holidays. The cruise ships will be able to cater to a 50% reduced passenger capacity. 
Safe distancing measures will be applied and face masks are enforced at all times. Passengers will also need to make a mandatory swab test before they are allowed onto the ships. With the number of local infections decreasing, the tourism industry here in Singapore hopes to regain their revenue stream as they start to recover from the pandemic. Marielle? Roy, are there any other precautions being taken in terms of COVID-19 procedures on the cruise ships? Yes, apart from physical distancing and the use of face masks, the cruise lines will ensure that the ventilation on the ships is not recirculated, allowing for fresh and clean air throughout the vessel. Emergency response plans are also in place for incidents relating to COVID-19 and the ship crew will undergo training specific to COVID-19 measures on board. Marielle? Thank you, Roy Cheka, live from Singapore. And uh, those are the reasons behind the news here in Australia and in other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you, Maria Latosa, reporting live from Perth, Australia. And those are the reasons behind the news, October 15, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold, I'm Angelo Castro III. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo, we serve the people, we give glory to God.